Thank you very much. It's uh, great to be in Israel. And uh, I should say that my PowerPoint slides are not going to be nearly as exciting as Roy's. Uh, I once went to uh, California to Palo Alto with, you know, spending time at a conference with very senior uh, Google, Facebook, Twitter executives, and they gave presentations. And I was shocked because all their PowerPoint presentations were terrible. Uh, lot of text, very badly organized, badly formatted. But ever since, I think I've been thinking if those titans of the information age cannot put together good PowerPoint presentations, why should I? So there you go. You will have to pay attention to what I say rather than to look at funny pictures. Now, what day could be more appropriate to talk about Al-Qaeda than today, the 11th anniversary of 9-11? And it's become very common to say that Al-Qaeda is in strategic decline, that it is defeated, that we don't need to worry about Al-Qaeda anymore. And the turning point thinking about that discussion was, of course, the killing of bin Laden. Not that bin Laden itself was important, but he stood like a symbol, and ever since, people have been talking about Al-Qaeda being a spent force. That's the dominant narrative, but is it actually true? My colleague, uh, Shiraz Meyer, who sits in the very back end I, has spent the past few months looking at all the statements that have come out by Al-Qaeda leaders over the past couple of years, and a lot of the discussions that have happened in extremist online forums where supporters of Al-Qaeda meet. And the picture that we see is not necessarily that of an organization defeated. It's not necessarily that of an organization winning either. Rather, it's an organization at the crossroads, hence the title of my talk. It's an organization responding to events rather than leading events, trying to identify opportunities, trying to stay relevant in situations that are beyond its control. It's not clear. It's an, I would say it's impossible right now to say, well, Al-Qaeda well, Al will be in one, two, three, or five years' time. What I want to do is to talk about how Al-Qaeda has responded to the most important events I would argue it has faced since 9-11, namely the Arab revolutions, the Arab Spring, whatever you want to call it. And what that response tells us about what Al-Qaeda is today and where it is likely to go in future. And I've divided the response that Al-Qaeda has shown to the Arab Spring into three phases that tell us a lot about how Al-Qaeda responds to situations and how it thinks about the situation across the Arab world and in the world as a whole today. First of all, though, let me say that Al-Qaeda was surprised by the Arab Spring like everyone else. They clearly didn't see it coming, and the late Anwar Laki said in Inspire magazine, no one saw it coming from Tunisia, but then when it came from Tunisia, no one saw it happening in Egypt. So they were as surprised as everyone else. Of course, they were happy because a lot of the people that were disposed, deposed by the Arab Spring were people they wanted to get rid of for a long time. But of course, there was a problem. The problem was that the revolutions were by and large peaceful. They were not following the methodology that Al-Qaeda had advocated for many, many years. And in addition to that, many of the people that went to the streets were not looking like the people that they wanted to see in power. They were looking, at least initially, like middle-class, Facebook-using, English-speaking, Western-educated people. And they weren't demanding the restoration of the caliphate either. So Al-Qaeda was happy about these dictators coming down. Al-Qaeda was at a loss what to do, how to make sense of it, and how to respond. And Ayman al-Zawahiri, who is now the leader of Al-Qaeda, came out with a series of lectures in which he offered an explanation from Al-Qaeda's point of view. And he put forward two arguments. The first argument was that what we saw in the streets of Cairo and T Tunis and other places was just the trigger. It was the tip of the iceberg. Really, even though the people who were involved in these revolutions didn't even necessarily realize it himself, but Al-Qaeda had laid the foundation for this to happen. He said, quote, the annihilation, annihilation of the Americans in Afghanistan and Iraq acted as strength and support for our people who are rising up against the corrupt and idolatrous tyrants. These successes helped in causing a popular 
cumulative movement and mobilization that led to the explosion of the popular volcano. So in other words, whilst you didn't see Al-Qaeda on the streets, really what al-Zawahiri was saying was that they had mobilized these people, even though they weren't realizing it, they had prepared them for what was going to happen. And the second part of the argument that he put forward was not only that they had advanced this mobilization, but that also they had taken care of America not helping Mubarak. He said, quote, the change in the American policy of supporting these despotic tyrants and to attempt to deal directly with the Muslim masses with their deceptive politics and soft power is a direct result of the blessed attacks on New York, Washington, and Pennsylvania. Since then, America and the rest of the West has rethought their policies. So in other words, he was saying the reason that Mubarak was, no, was not supported any stronger by the United States and that therefore Mubarak was allowed to go and that he could fall was partly because of what Al-Qaeda did on 9-11. It's a variation of the near far enemy theme. So Zawahiri really cast out a hugely important role for Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda really was behind all of this even though it was not obvious. Now whatever you think of these arguments, the truth is no one really bought it. These arguments gained no traction, even amongst supporters of Al-Qaeda. They were not really buying into the idea that Al-Qaeda was behind these revolutions. And so after the first phase of these revolutions, Al-Qaeda really was where it started. It didn't have a role. It was a day loss. It couldn't respond to these events appropriately. But there was a second phase. After the dust settled in Tunisia and Egypt and the revolutionary caravan moved on to other countries, it became increasingly clear that even though initially many of the faces on the streets in Tahrir Square and other places were of young westernized Facebook users, the Arab street, the majority of the population in these countries actually had, in many cases, Islamist sympathies. In Egypt, in Tunisia, the Brotherhood won the parliamentary elections. And it suddenly seemed as if those Facebook revolutions were actually greening. They were becoming Islamic revolutions. And indeed, one of the military leaders of Al-Qaeda said, whether by the might of the mighty or by the humiliation of the ignoble, regardless of whether people like it or not, Islam is making a comeback. So suddenly, you again had Al-Qaeda people being enthusiastic and being excited about these revolutions because suddenly they realized we might have a part of this, a part, part, part of the action after all. Now, of course, the problem was that a lot of the organizations that came to power, Muslim Brotherhood-linked organizations, were not organizations that Al-Qaeda had been particularly friendly to. In fact, Al-Qaeda many cases was criticizing, was making fun even, of these organizations very consistently over the years. They were soft, they were ideologically deviant. Al-Qaeda really knew better. You only had to listen and follow Al-Qaeda. So Vahri historically had very few kind words to say about Hamas, the Brotherhood, and other groups. But now they were taking power, and suddenly Al-Qaeda wanted to be friends again, like on Facebook. So you saw people like Alibi saying suddenly something very unusual about groups like the Brotherhood. He said, Al-Qaeda does not have a magic wand. After 20 years of pretending that Al-Qaeda was the solution to practically every problem in the Muslim world, Al-Qaeda does not have a magic wand. It is only a small part of the striving. Do not overestimate it. We should all know our abilities. Let us aid each other in piousness, righteousness, making jihad and way of Allah everyone according to his place and role with whatever they can and is proper to them. So suddenly Al-Qaeda was eating humble pie. It just wanted a small piece of the action. It was suddenly happy to leave the center stage to the Brotherhood. It was happy to play the role of the armed vanguard and let other people do the politics. It was a very different tone from the Al-Qaeda that we used to hear from all the time before. There's another quote that I found quite interesting. He said, there's no need to indulge in differences about the various Islamic movements. And this, again, from an organization that was making a point 
of all these differences for 20 years. Rather, they should start by focusing on construction and preparation of Muslim unity. Same applies to brothers in Egypt, Sinai, Rafa, and others. Let kindness and good manners and tolerance of people's various differences lead you. So this was a very new Al-Qaeda, and it wasn't an accident that suddenly Al-Qaeda was friendly and humble and moderate. It was forced into that situation by the events that clearly had overtaken them. Again, of course, none of this was paying off in the sense that a lot of these brotherhood governments were not necessarily keen to reach out to Al-Qaeda. In that sense, a lot of these words were maybe impressing sympathizers and causing discussions on extremist online forums, but they had no real-world effect. But then comes the third phase, and this is the phase that presented Al-Qaeda again with opportunities. This is the phase that I and my colleagues would describe as the potential comeback phase. So at first we had peaceful westernized Facebook revolutionaries which left Al-Qaeda at a loss. When it became clear that many of the new governments would be Islamist, at least Al-Qaeda could reach out to them. And then of course, when the Arab Spring turned into the Arab Autumn, maybe the Arab Winter, not only did the revolutions become greener, they also became more violent. First in Libya. In fact, one of the unintended consequences of the revolution in Libya has been the empowering of Islamists in parts of the Sahel, northern Mali, etc. Political instability in Yemen. Most promising from Al-Qaeda's point of view, the situation in Syria. What started as a peaceful uprising in the style of the Egyptian revolution became something like a protracted civil war. And unlike Egypt, there's also a sectarian dimension. Bashar al-Assad is not just a secular dictator like Mubarak and Ben Ali. His family and much of his inner circle are Lawis, a Shia sect which Al-Qaeda regards as heretical. And Hussein bin Mahmoud, one of Al-Qaeda's spiritual leaders, said, victory belongs to the Mujahideen who support the truth and stand up against the apostate and disbelieving Alawi. So in this third phase of the Arab revolutions, you suddenly had Al-Qaeda perceiving an opportunity. Not only were these revolutions no longer secular, not only were they Islamist, now actually there was need for violence. There was need for the methodology that Al-Qaeda had promoted for years. And so Al-Qaeda felt vindicated. Al-Qaeda felt like telling the world, we told you so. Don't abandon the use of violence. You need an armed vanguard because in situations like Syria, peaceful revolution is not enough. The important point is not so much the military one. There are a lot of disagreements about how many foreign fighters exactly are in Syria, how large the part of Al-Qaeda is in the Syrian revolution. The important point is an ideological, strategic one. The Arab Spring started out very badly for Al-Qaeda. It started with peaceful revolutions which seemed to be in favor of Western secular democracy. And now we've gotten to a point where violence still plays a role and where it seems like Islamists are taking over a lot of the governments that are being brought down. Al-Qaeda initially clearly struggled to explain what was going on, but gradually it started to make sense of it. And now with Africa, Yemen, especially Syria, the Al-Qaeda narrative, the Al-Qaeda narrative of violent revolutions in order to establish Islamic rule is again relevant. It's a fight against secular dictators for Islamic rule, and it's the powerful assertion that ultimately, peaceful means go only so far that you need to have an armed vanguard to make your point. And that's why Al-Qaeda is at the crossroads. It's not winning, I don't think anyone says that. But I think it's simply too early to say that it is defeated. None of us know how the situation in Syria will play out over time. None of us know who will be in government in Syria in five years, in three years, in two years, in two months. Al-Qaeda doesn't know, and it is far from sure that Al-Qaeda will be able to use Syria as a launch pad for its revival. But it's not impossible either. Al-Qaeda is at the crossroads. And just because America killed Al-Qaeda's leaders 
a few other leaders, and very successfully so, just because Al-Qaeda in the tribal areas of Pakistan is pretty much defeated, that does not mean that Al-Qaeda is finished. On that point, I am finished. Thank you very much.